I'd like to introduce you to the last formal lecture we're having in Environmental Science 1401. This is lecture 14, which is chapters 19 and 20 in your book, and we're looking at environmental organizations and briefly about policy. And you'll also be seeing an accompanying video to look at um, the structure of our government and how laws are made, because this is very important in understanding the way we get policies, particularly about environmental issues and regulations. Now, something very interesting about the history of environmental policy, we have seen environmental recommendations and regulations that go back to um, old times. You know, we know in, re in records around Europe, around the uh, time of the Magna Carta, there were concerns about pollution, and we know that ancient people, uh, uh, ancient civilizations that we have records of, did show signs that pollution was a concern, and they did things to do about it. And particularly the first pollution concern we had was getting rid of human waste, either food waste or our solid waste and liquid waste, you know, in the form of our pee and poop, to be honest with you. And this is where a lot of early technologies came to try to deal with uh, waste, particularly uh, during this period of rapid settlement formation and urbanization. But what's really interesting, too, about uh, environmental science is that really most of our policies in the United States have not come about to the 1960s and 70s. And this is kind of a shame that we really had no agency that oversaw the um, uh, regulations, except the Food and Drug Administration maybe, which even they were kind of new. And we had very little regulations at the time governing food health. But environmental health came late on the um, record when it comes to American history and also the history of many other countries. And, and part of this is due to the work of several key people, very important people that were not afraid to shout out their message. And one of them was uh, Rachel Carson, who wrote a book called Silent Spring. She was an environmental toxicologist, very uh, similar training to I had. Uh, and um, she became very well aware of the effects of pesticides uh, on wildlife because she got to see the effects of this and then became concerned about the, the effects on human health. And she helped make some landmark um, um, recommendations that went into producing the Environmental Protection Agency. So people can do things. Usually it takes a very special type of person and a person in the right place and time. And during her time, we didn't have all the news and social media. So when she did become publicized, it was really, you know, one, it was really not much out there that was competing with her. Today, when someone comes forward, there are just so many mixed messages that we don't see these, you know, big one-time people coming out and not being overshadowed by others. And, and that's nice, too, for Rachel Carson, because a lot of people discounted her, but, but they didn't get as much publicity as she did. So, again, in environmental science, a few people made a big difference for us. And, and not people that were usually on the radar, but people put themselves there, you know, by using press, by using books, and getting the message out to the right people. Changes in environmental policy also came about due to shifts in how people think. And the way people treated waste, as far as their general behavior, accepted behavior, is very different than what we see today. And each generation has their own attitudes about how we treat the environment and how we respond to our own environmental health. So again, um, what we see is that as environmental policy grew and environmental awareness grew, so did environmental groups and other organizations. And this was, uh, and also what we call intergovernmental agencies. And that means organizations that set regulations. And a lot of these agencies just grew. And some organizations like what's called uh, ASTM, which I'm a, a member of and serve on a couple of committees looking at environmental apply, uh, compliance, is um, they're an old agency that went back to engineering standards and automobile standards. And now they set standards on what does it mean to have good environmental stewardship. And they even help define sustainability and resiliency when we look at how companies and manufacturing operates. And even the fisheries industry is very big now into looking at sustainability and agriculture because they're at a loss if they lose their revenue. So we have these, um, so groups like the World Wildlife Fund 
work with fishermen, work with agricultural entities to look at, you know, how do we manage our fish stock? How do we manage agriculture to make sure that we can do this in the future and feed a burgeoning world's population? And sometimes that might even mean removing a sector of agriculture and move and looking at other food sources. Uh, um, and next week, we're going to have a fun little activity that you're going to do that's kind of like a capstone for our course on food sources, because that's something that really affects a lot of personal choice and a lot of upbringing as far as how we're going to do, the, you know, how do we eat sustainably. And for those of you out there that are vegans or vegetarians, you're doing that now by looking at strategies that reduce the inputs that go into animals to grow plants for animals to eat and just eat the plants themselves and find comparable protein sources, particularly to replace, uh, you know, poultry and dairy and, and beef and meats. So guys, so when we start looking at making change, change is probably best done through social groups and organizations. It means collectives of people that can support their own activities, that can distribute the workload, that you know could make connections. And this has been the biggest effort in the growth of modern environmentalism today and sustainability. Now, certain individuals have the luck and the funding and the connections to do this on their own, like Bill Gates, you know, can fund things, you know out of his rear end and be very, you know, media savvy, but not everybody could be like him. And certain actors and actresses too can get very involved in the environmental movement. But the problem is their fame is temporary. So you should be rely on groups and particularly social groups, which are collections of people who interact with each other with a common goal or mission. Or we can look at organizations that have a very formalized structure it's a formal structure group that usually has specific duties involved or associated with careers or a particular type of mission, like certain environmental organizations that want to protect a particular animal or just predict ecosystems or whatever they feel like doing. Now, when I was doing environmental science, it was in the Stone Age before cell phones and before social media and it wasn't before internet internet existed i mean i used it at university of illinois but it was very very few people had access to it it was mostly associated with military and certain types of data sharing and um i used it mainly just to text funny enough and also to collect raw data and then put it into a mainframe to run statistics, but it wasn't a way to socially communicate. And it wasn't until the World Wide Web, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, that it became easy. Because I remember having a program in DOS and and, and the earlier forms of uh, similar to HTML it was a real pain. The platform was not very user friendly and, and, and pictures had to be uploaded as data bits you know, through a telephone and that could take forever. Sometimes it took two days to get uh, information sent from one university to another, you know, just literally using these big mainframe computers. But today it's incredible and social networks have had a positive impact on politics, on businesses and on getting your word out and forming social networking, social groups. But the problem is it's also been a source of overwhelming information. Politicians are inundated with surveys and and th you know particularly from facebook and they're sick of pinterest and all these other things that that promote causes and and you know some twitter and things that submit information to politicians websites so now we're overwhelmed with this you know to the point where it's almost becoming invisible and we have to use so our social networks correctly. I mostly use social networking to make contact with people, usually through LinkedIn or Twitter. Facebook is just to be whatever. You know, I set it up to communicate with my kids and they, don't want, and they block me out of Facebook. I mean, it's typical that I use something else, so I don't see what's going on with them really. But um, anyway, but I use that sometimes for groups, but a lot of times it's just for groups to post stuff within the group to say, hey, this is going on and it maintains our connectivity that way. And, you know, of course, and then there's Zoom and other things that we use. So we've now in what we call an information overload society, and it's very difficult to get the attention of politicians. And we can't do it 
in a derogatory way. We can't do it in a shock way. And we have to be very clever on how we do it so it doesn't look like junk or propaganda. We have to support our information very much so. And that's what politicians particularly look for. And also, you know, regular people who want to join a group too. So again, when we look at um, social networks, the, the problem I find with social networks is they there's very little middle ground with them. It's very polarized. That means you have your, you know, your right side, your left side, your environmental side, your industrial side. And sometimes in the middle, they throw barbs at each other if they check each other's sites at all sometimes. And sometimes they just, you know, one side lurks on the other to see what's going on. But um, usually these are, you're working with tight-knit people that are mostly acting as a support group. And a lot of governments, I know have been in several countries where the governments were watching our social networks and they did allow it. Um, and they were monitoring it to look for trends. And then there's these influencers, which I'm not too happy with. I've known a couple and I didn't, they didn't influence me one bit, but they have very unusual effects, very much like I told you, there's certain people that could, an individual can push an incredible amount of environmental change or be noted with something like uh, f former Vice President Al Gore associated with global climate change. He didn't bring it into the forefront. As a matter of fact, he, I met him once when I was learning how to lobby in Washington, D.C., and he was not in support of global climate change at the time. The energy commissioner was that we talked to. I mean, he had a very a technical background and understood some of the science of it, but Gore did not. And all of a sudden I was really surprised. And one day now he's the main you know, go-to person when you talk about the earlier development of concerns about global climate change. So, you know, you have these influences out there that it, that it could either be good or bad, but they could be unknowledgeable and do more damage to a cause than anything else, or just go about it very improperly. And I work with a couple uh, through Twitter, and I communicate with them, and some I make use of to a point, and others I make use of a lot because I like their ethics and I like their background knowledge, their expertise. So why are organizations important for change? Because usually one person's voice is invisible. Again, when you're with a group, and particularly a group that has a heck of a lot of money they lobby that means they go they send people to uh, professional lobbyists or attorneys or po political science majors to talk to politicians if they don't do it individually themselves i mean i've done that for a while with a group called unit concerned scientists that uh, would talk to politicians and you know so they they're listened to and they can sway voters, which is very important. And they can recommend on policy and they have all the eyes and ears out for looking at when potential policies are coming up so they can make comments about it. And also when you start getting, looking at like big corporations is they can put a lot of money into marketing and they could also put, say, wow, I want to look green. I want to look good to the people because people want this. And they could become more environmentally friendly. They could also look more at human rights issues, too, like, you know, my, you know, my sport shoes are manufactured by child labor in Bangladesh, blah, blah, blah. And these poor kids get paid a dollar, you know, a day for, for something that's they're not seeing a penny of basically that's selling for a couple of hundred dollars a shoe in the United States. So they don't see the, 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 the actual profit of that product. So big is good. And we'll learn about that. And a lot of organizations are setting bottom lines. We're going to learn later what's called the triple bottom line. That means we're going to look at, a, you know, basically the typical thing businesses look for is profit, you know, uh, basically sustainability of that product life cycle, you know, am I, am I serving people, but also am I having a good public reputation by being green? And some companies don't respect that. Some countries don't respect and don't encourage green, but we tend to be a country that is more and more doing that. Maybe not for every individual, but at least some very important organizations are and, and very big, you know, states that have a lot of consumers. So when we look at groups out there, we have what are called for-profit businesses, obviously, and this includes much of commerce. And there are some that are privately held. I mean, my family had a couple of, matter of fact, we had about five small businesses that we did, and they were privately held because it was us that held it. And 
and hand it down in a family, which I really didn't want part of it anymore. You know, one of my brothers did, you know, and um, whatever that happens. Uh, so you have people that are hired within the company, but basically there's a founder and an owner. And then you have publicly held ones that are um, owned by stockholders. So that means in this corporation, this person's pleasing themselves and running their own mission where here, the people that run the public group have to make them money <coughs> or give them, you know, the sense of belonging that our company is doing the right thing and we want you as a stockholder because by you owning shares, that's money for us. So this is very important when we look at how we approach companies and how we influence companies. These you're looking at one big person. Here you're looking at influencing stockholders that can then either buy out or sell those stocks, whatever. And Tesla's an example of that, where he pleases people. He makes stockholders want to own stuff in that company where his stocks are, you know, my gosh, one of his shares at, at one point was more than my uh, two months of my salary. It was ridiculous. So um, again, so when we start looking at making business, for-profit organizations own up, don't forget they're working for the consumer. So your buying habits, your perceptions of what you want out of companies is in your buying habits. If we, and so they're looking at us, both of them, but there's two different influencers within, either the owner of that company that also runs it or family runs it, or the stockholders here that have a major influence on a publicly held company to the point where they can fire this per the people that are in charge, or at least recommend that they go look for other jobs. Now, for-profit businesses know that today green and being environmentally friendly is good. And sometimes they do a good job on it. They become um, what we call, they develop a corporate social responsibility and there are entities, agencies that certify this. I mean, the government also certifies this, but man, they're a pain in the butt and it's very strict and, you know, politicians can change that. But we also have independent agencies made up of experts. And then we just have social groups that just say, hey, man, you're doing green because we like you, you know, whatever. So sometimes it means nothing to be corporate socially responsible. But sometimes there are measurables we can look at. And we have many people that criticize this because um, we do have this situation called greenwashing in which companies can basically promote that over and over and over again. And really, um, they're not working as sustainably as we think they are. Or in this country, they're operating cleanly, but maybe not so outside of the United States where they might be doing a major part of their business. So guys, so I mentioned this triple bottom line when we start looking at accounting in industries. And basically we used to have just two metrics, consumer and profit. And that profit was either for the corporation itself or for the corporation and the stockholders, if it's a publicly held company. And that was about it, okay? And profit, the problem with profit is whenever environmental regulations came in, it cut into that profit. Not always, but generally it did. It reduced the profit and sometimes it affects competition because if you didn't follow those regulations, you became uncompetitive next to other people or else if some, and, and sometimes it worked in reverse. If you weren't getting pressure for not, you know, doing environmentally smart things, you were running cheaper because other people were paying and losing more money on their products, whatever. And that's why a lot of overseas companies really competed well in the United States because we were paying, a lot of our companies were losing money because of paying for environmental regulations and fines while foreign competitors weren't. So this can work both ways sometimes when we look at environmental regulations in effect on profit because we can benefit by saying, wow, my product is green, or we could lose by saying, damn, my competitors are not doing this and they're still selling. But the other thing now we have in there is planet. And basically, you know, this is where your greenwashing comes in sometimes as companies say and they advertise that they're green, but we got to make sure that they are and that they're not just doing one thing like donating money to a cause. That's greenwashing, when, especially when you're not operating cleanly. And the same is true also for when it comes to companies saying that they now follow human rights. 
affirmative action. This is now extending this triple line to maybe quadruple line that we treat people fairly too, which is part of environmental health too. Then we have nonprofit organizations and some groups called non-governmental organizations or NGOs, uh, um, which I belong to several of these. And also I belong to professional organizations that happen to be in environmental science or in science itself. And we get involved in environmental issues, issues too. So not profit organizations doesn't mean they don't make money. It means that they basically spend what they make and the money is used just for the corporation, not for people to become rich. They do pay salaries, but the thing is, is their accounting is very much different than you see in a regular business because they, they have to have different checks and balances within the work and they can't be given the money again for like vacations or to pay for kids tuition in college. This is totally for charitable work that they have to account for. And I know this from being a treasurer on a couple of groups that man, we gotta pay attention to a lot of stuff that's just incredible. And we're scrutinized heavily by the internal revenue sometimes because we have to file a charter all the time to maintain our status. But these groups, they can be very small they could also have incredible political influence and put some of that money into lobbying, lobbying, which is legitimate. Or they can put money into lawyers that sue, you know, the government when, you know, legislators are voting on policy. Or we can sue corporations and, and, and work that way to look at environmental offenders. So we see that there are many types of nonprofit organizations that overlap with environmental issues, including organizations for arts and humanities, believe it or not. Okay, uh, ones involved in public health, human health, okay, human services, education, because we have, you know, we want to educate people about the environment, and you just name it. And there are groups that can protect anything. There are groups that protect a particular frog in Puerto Rico, the coqui, a tiny frog that's very loud. I've heard them. They kept me up all night. And the frog's about the size of a, a, an American dime, if you know what a dime is, you know, a 10 cent piece. So, I mean, there are a lot of groups out there and a lot of them, you know, do a lot of good. Some of them just make a lot of noise and some of them are very radical. Some of them work well with politicians. It varies a lot. And if you're going to be with these groups, you have to put your efforts into what you feel your philosophy is and where you can get involved. And then we have these groups in environmental science that provide other types of benefits, benefit organizations. These are more like corporations that do have volunteers, but it's not like a social group. It's not like, you know, you know um, some of the the groups like Friends of Texas Wildlife or something like that. But these, what they, they basically do is they fund things. They fund businesses. They, they encourage businesses and they encourage social change. And this is, for example, the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, they've given me fellowships and training and workshops for free a couple of times. That's the only time I've been to Disney, uh, Disney World was uh, the World Wildlife Fund because we were staying at their facility you know, promoting and work with their people on wildlife education. And we stayed in the safari part of it. It was kind of fun, but also I was overwhelmed by just the consumerism of um, Disney and, you know, whatever. We did discuss that with them. We have corporations called um, B Corps, and these are a little different. And these are uh, um, less formal groups. So we'll be covering um, a little later, but um, they also provide benefits by usually uh, doing lawsuits again and, and, and doing other efforts against companies. But usually these are highly structured companies with employ I mean, not companies, but organizations with employees that do have some volunteers, but usually not meetings that involve regular input with the public. So here's your B Corp. It's the newest of these. And sometimes what they'll do is assess products, they'll make comments. There's a B Corp that works with, uh, um, you know, not eating beef, encouraging veganism, vegetarianism, just, uh, organic farming. They'll help, they'll, they'll consult on the government to make up uh, um, regulations for organic foods. I mean, that's what the government does. 
they go to B Corps to say, could you help us? We want to make sure this fits organic standards, or we want to do this, or we, if you're going to label it organic, we want to make sure it's okay. Or if this chicken's free range, what does it mean to be free range? You know, stuff like that. So B Corps do help a lot, and they're found throughout. Their, uh, they get unusual types of funding, sometimes grants, sometimes uh, uh, rich people that want to promote their organizations, but they do run like companies. And, and um, they can make profits in which those profits can go into their cause and also be used for various purposes, even sometimes, you know, um, doing small manufacturing, like I knew some people that know they'll produce kits or produce something that the public can use to, let's say, purify water. They'll do research and development. Now, um, any group working with the environment or any company that is wanting to be environmentally friendly now has to deal with this issue of sustainability because sustainability is not a new concept but the word itself and its common usage now is becoming very important and it's kind of new i mean it started out as smart growth being green this and that and People were not happy with some of the older terms or livable, and now we're looking at sustainable. So it's not just cool today to just say, well, I'm, you know, protecting frogs. I'm doing this. I'm doing that is because we've seen in the past that companies sometimes do things and then stop. But what they're doing is really not going to work in the long term. So sustainability means long term. Is a company conserving resources? Are they, you know, guaranteeing jobs for a future? Are they doing this? Are they, you know, going to be continually reducing pollution or keeping it at a certain level for many, many, many generations? And we see some companies take, you know, a grab on this, like Ikea and 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 um, certain furniture companies are making sure that their materials are, you know, require less and less resources, don't pollute, that they're recyclable or reusable, or their stuff lasts a while. And that takes a hit when you have to make something that lasts a long time and people don't have to replace it, which luckily most consumers get tired of stuff pretty quickly and sell the stuff before the replacement cycle. And sometimes that even goes into sustainability. How do I make a product that people are going to want to use over and over again and not make it too trendy? That's the problem. So sustainability is something we still got to figure out. And how do we do this in a sustainable way to meet the demands now of what environmental groups and agencies and hopefully eventually governments will be looking for. So when we start looking at sustainability. The problem with sustainability is that it's a big thing. It's very difficult to manage and to sometimes achieve. I mean, it is. There's a lot of components to it and you have to show measurables. So when companies operate, they have mission statements and then strategies of how to get to those mission statements. I mean, our college does too. You can read it online, you know, and um, within the mission statement, you have to see evidence of sustainability today. And this is becoming something that uh, people are scrutinizing. They're going to corporate websites and looking for mission statements or st strategies that, you know, protect the environment and protect environmental health or or don't infringe on human rights or don't particularly lean towards a political party, blah, blah, blah. And this is becoming a very big thing today. And particularly since the, uh, the web presence is we're seeing more and more transparency where companies can't hide this anymore. And things like the Freedom of Information Act and other stuff that we can look up, you know, uh, and whistleblowers, just all this stuff now is available for us to see and to hold agencies and corporations accountable. So yes, it's nice to come up with a good mission statement, but to come up with strategies is very important. How are you going to be sustainable? How are you going to make your computers, like for example, Apple recyclable? How are you going to make a product life cycle where this thing could be reused or recycled very easily? How could you make a product that does not involve toxic materials or does not require being disposed of, you know, in a special way? These are all things that you have to have. And this is where I belong to a group called uh, ASTM you know, which is, it's kind of like an invitation type thing. You don't just say, I want to join in, particularly to be on a committee. You have to have a certain expertise, but we sit down and we help companies with these strategies. And we look at what are called best practices, photo strategies or best practices to achieve 
a corporation's mission statement. And believe me, we fight about it a lot because there's an international group. And we have to worry too about countries worrying about how these things are going to be and make us competitive with each other. And not the, you know, if we follow these, that we're not competitive compared to other companies. Or if one cup, uh, you know, country uses these standards, other countries feel like they're forced to do it. So this is a very difficult challenge when we look at the universalization of sustainability. And we have to think about also sustainability from the perspective of global, not just for our country. We have to look at sustainability based on doing this without great expense and without costing people their jobs, basically. Guys, and the problem with any group you work with, you're going to have an organizational culture. And guys, just because people belong to a group doesn't mean they all think the same. I mean, there are similarities that they have, but they each have their own unique components of the culture. And sometimes they fit in completely with the culture, sometimes not. I know I'm one of the people that don't fit into anywhere, really. But you have your organizational culture, which is affected by the, the nature of the members, how you recruit members and in corporations, who you hire how you interview people, what you're looking for, okay? And, and, and then there's the organizational structure, which looks at the, the, the way the company's arranged, the way groups of people work together, and the way strategies work. And where's the input coming? We have corporations that are totally, and organizations that are totally top down. The people on top tell the people on the bottom what to do. And then you get into this um, Asian model, which was developed you know, in Japan and promoted very heavily in the United States, where the workers a lot of times determine how the things should be done because they're the bottom line. They're also the consumers, but they know how things are manufactured and they know what can work better and cheaper and still get a quality product. And they work back and forth. It's not just one's telling the other what to do, but there's a back and forth. And then there's also uh, delegative styles where the top can delegate certain people that disagree with the top sometimes or or have their own views and they communicate with the bottom and act as representatives for the people in the bottom of the structure. So a big question for us that's very frustrating is how can it, members of an organization cause change or facilitate change? And um, I mean, at our college, environmental science and biology students have implemented change by encouraging the college to become greener. So the students work with professors, the professors worked with their direct administrators, direct administrators spoke to the college president, and then we spoke to the chancellor who runs the whole system, and they can say, well, you guys do your own thing, but keep it in the budget, blah, blah, blah. So we've made change from the bottom up. It all depends on on the culture of the system. Our college has a culture where, believe it or not, we do listen to students. You go to larger universities, that's not necessarily true. So it depends on the culture, how the members of an individual organization fit in with making change, particularly in interpreting and designing sustainable industries. Now guys, you're, sometimes when we run into sustainability issues, there are groups that promote a decrease in fossil fuels. And this is particularly true for those that are promoting global climate change. And I believe that this is a necessary thing to do. You can't eliminate it, but you can surely reduce it. And this is very difficult for corporations to accept because how do they cut the use of fossil fuels or discourage them and still carry out business as usual? And, and, and what people could even do individually is, is that you can say, well, I'm not going to buy stock in a company that doesn't do this. And that's an indirect way to the company and go, damn, people are not buying my stocks. If I'm a publicly traded company, I'm in trouble. So I got to now become more socially responsible with that. So we're seeing that particularly today uh, with the big you know, promotion of global climate change and a lot of people being accepting of it is um, that we're using our power not so much to work within a system, but to work outside the system and and tell the corporate culture or or you know hey this is what we want and we're going to do this by not buying a product or by encourage change through stockholders or you know telling government to find ways to regulate you so um early on in the environmental movement um corporations were um how can we put this they 
worked within to look at how to handle environmental compliance. And th their internal initiatives were like looking at that bottom line and still focusing on profit. And now we're seeing that a lot of outside influence could help too to develop internal initiatives. Okay. Now when we start, and, and particularly for for-profit organizations, again, they do have the bottom line of money. I mean, that's their priority. And they have to delicately balance, you know, the whole idea of being green or being environmentally friendly. And, you know, who do they listen to as far as this being a driving force? Because they could become environmentally green or make a product a little different that's more environmentally friendly and it might crash. It might sink if consumers don't buy it. So these are very difficult decisions to make and some corporate cultures don't work well with this, especially the top down ones, because sometimes executives just make the decisions based on whatever information they want to use. So a lot of nonprofit groups have looked at corporations, have looked at entities that deal with energy and other things, and they're basically now, these nonprofit groups are saying, you know, we're now going to be more, you know, active by directly going into corporations instead of going to governments. Because sometimes governments move slowly and they don't always want to set regulations to hurt corporations. I mean, we know this. They don't, you know, they're, we supplement petrol. We don't want to take away those subsidies because it provides a lot of jobs and it looks bad to say we're not going to encourage petro. But nonprofit groups can go in and they can pester the hell out of petrol companies, chemical companies to do a better job. And this is where efforts are now being put. At one time, I focused when I was working with environmental groups a little more actively, we're talking to politicians. Now I'm talking to corporate people. And sometimes we do this in very big ways like Greenpeace. I don't necessarily go with their strategies of sometimes, I mean, you know, they sometimes can be very intimidating to work with and very aggressive. I tend not to be that way, but um, they could also act as consultants to companies and provide free resources to companies and also sometimes shame companies into doing the right thing. And and because it's difficult to do that with politicians. So this has been a new trend now in looking at um, environmental groups being more influencers of the corporations themselves, whereas working with the government, it's an indirect way of doing it. And government's a little hesitant sometimes to put too much control on industry because government too is looking for profit and employment. We're also starting to see nonprofit and non-governmental groups also working together on similar missions. Like Sierra Club is much more animal based but guys, sometimes people don't give a damn about birds like Audubon Group. They don't care about certain forests. They don't care about a disappearing toad. So what Sierra Clubs will do is they'll work with public health groups and say if the environment is killing frogs, it's killing people. And if it's harming trees, it's harming people. And this brings a little more oomph to politicians when they see a certain section of their population is being harmed by certain practices. But, you know, to save a toad is different than to save a group of people. And particularly when we start looking at people that are underserved, that are disproportionately affected by environmental insults more than others. So, and also when environmental groups work, they have to also work with the entities that they're regulating. For example, the whaling industry, or the fishing industry, they have to do it in a way that you can still maintain an industry or give the industry options because governments are not that great at doing this. I mean, sometimes we'll take a group of people, send them to college and say, hey, let's get let's back down on petrol. Let's increase solar. So we'll train all these people to do solar. Our college tried that at one time and it flopped. We, it, it just wasn't a need right now for people installing solar panels or manufacturing them. So we have college, we have college programs to train people to do to install windmills. And that's still not a big deal. So a lot of times we have to work with the entities that are going to be affected by environmental regulation and particularly, you know, ones that are involved in agriculture and, uh, and natural resources like mining and ease them into this and give them a way out and, and also learn to compromise. Environmental groups, per se, I say, overall have to learn to compromise a little better and many of have. 
They know sometimes change will be slow and they're learning to be better at giving options rather than demands. Media is the biggest problem because media can be biased. Haha, <laughs> it's not supposed to be biased, but whatever. And social media can be a pain in the butt because it's just, there's no control, very little controls over it, except maybe the Twitter and Facebook police, you know, which that's arbitrary and politicized. But, um, you know, you look at groups like Ikea, who, um, you know, at one time they were subject to bad publicity and the company turned around and they now, you know, are pretty much have a lot of sustainable practices. And we look at other companies that throughout time that the bad publicity did make them more accountable. And, but this doesn't always work. You know, companies hire lawyers to handle bad publicity. Uh, fishing industry has been getting bad publicity about uh, what's called bycatch. That means turtles and other animals and things that are not part of the catch, they get caught and they die. And this led to um, policies and also education programs and subsidies for fishermen that use them. We give them a reward system and we don't, and we penalize them if they don't use these things. Or what we do is the government can encourage to, um, you know, market fish or give leases to fish, you know, fishing operations that use these excluders that keep turtles and other things that are harmed by the fish industry out of the nets. So there's different ways of doing it. And, and sometimes the media helps by bringing out an issue because most of you probably never heard of bycatch and all the problems in the industry and also all the things that are affected by agriculture that we don't hear about. Sometimes publicity helps this. A lot of times it brings out negative reactions from the people you're affecting, but also it's enough to say this to shame these groups into coming up with compromises and in a, in a win-win situation. Because sometimes the problems when you use companies to be advocates for change that say we're doing this, we're being green, you know, blah, blah, blah. Amazon's encouraging recycling of boxes. Well, I wish they just sent out less, but whatever, we're being more responsible with this and we're going to be buying hydrogen, you know, vehicles and encourage our people to deliver with energy efficient vehicles. Sometimes what you get is certain corporations dominate the field and they have an outsized influence and they can afford to take losses or work at a tighter margin because they're selling more units. And this penalizes and affects competition. It affects corporations that can't afford this and even, you know, family owned businesses that can't keep up with that. And it does create almost like a monopoly sometimes. So sometimes it's good that you have spokesman companies that come out like Tesla and others, you know, to stand and say, we're doing this, we're doing this, blah, 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 blah. And it makes the, the others look bad, which they should, but also the others cannot achieve that. And they can go out of business, be out competed. And also just look bad in general, because it looks like they're not doing anything when they're still, you know, have to hire employees and do have to make a profit and are held accountable if they're a publicly held uh, uh, business. Now guys, so sometimes nonprofit groups, particularly the big wealthy ones, which they could be a problem too if they dominate the market, they can actually provide incentives for companies to do the right thing. And um, so like Walmart, for example, could work with great sustainable product manufacturers and that could end up making Walmart look sustainable, particularly if enough of their products are like that. Uh, Environmental Defense Council, a group I work with, um, we, I consult on best practices for uh, contaminated water cleanup. Okay, and what happens is this agency that sponsors me and puts me in contact with these different countries and different entities, and they provide legal advice and funding. And also they petition and actually sue governments to say, you got to fund this for these groups or else, you know, we're going to make sure you get sanctions from the United Nations and from the United States and blah, blah, blah. And this is really kind of neat how this all works together. Because guys, corporations work well. When you have to tell them to do something that's going to cut into profits and you help subsidize them to the point where they can eventually become profitable. I mean, the government does this too by giving money. So guys, so now to go on to the road of policy is environmental policy globally is still pretty young. 
you know, when we look at formalized pro uh, policies and also agencies that actually that's their job. Their specific job is to look at the environment. I mean, we have the Environmental Protection Agency, but we also have other agencies like USDA, US Geological Survey, um, you know, other groups that also work with environmental issues, either gathering data, making recommendations, or developing technologies, or promoting universities to do research, or working with other groups, you know, particularly uh, political action groups, and working with um, uh, non governmental agencies. So, you know, it's taken a while for our policies to get established and to fit into the regular realm of how policies made and how governments work. But the problem is when you look at policies, you really have to understand the government of where you're going. And this is something I research pretty well before I go into another country. But a lot of my colleagues don't. And I ran into some problems, particularly in China, where I, did, I went with a group in China to look at more sustainable agricultural methods because, you know, they are produce a lot of agriculture, produce a lot of pollution, and they are concerned about it. They are concerned about the health of their people in many ways because the people do complain that they, I mean, they're allowed to and they, if they all get sick, they can't work. So, um, but I know that their decisions, you have to talk to the upper government and convince the upper government. And you don't convince them, you give them the idea. And you say, here's some options that we do. Pick the one you like. I had a colleague that was so mad that he was trying to sell them an idea that he eventually started swearing and cursing and yelling. And his poor interpreter was like gently being careful, talking to, you know, the uh, minister of agriculture from China and um, trying to tell him that um, you, I'm just very, instead of saying, I think you're a jerk and you're not listening to me, the poor interpreter is going, I see we have a disagreement and, and I'm very emotional about it rather than I'm saying the F word and whatever. Luckily, some of the people that we were working with did not speak English. I'm sure some of them did and just held back, you know, the politicians we were talking to. So, um, you know, government is still working out how do we fit in environmental laws? Where do they go? and who, what agencies handle them, because we have a very fragmented government that sometimes environmental laws work in, a, in another agency better than, let's say, the Environmental Protection Agency. So the problem I have with working with environmental policy, and this is true for any group that I work with, is you can set wonderful policies. But the problem with policies is they're very fragmented. Some policies don't always work well with others. They're very specific, and there's no unity to them. And a lot of policies really don't focus on long-term thinking. It's sometimes done in political cycles. And what has to happen is we have to look at, when we make a policy, look at where does this fit into or influence sustainability. And this is the biggest hassle right now because we're still trying to get a grasp. What does it mean to be sustainable? Who's going to benefit? Who's going to hurt? You know, how are we going to achieve this? Do we set a 10 year goal, a five year goal? How do we do this and how do we measure sustainability? So just because we're passing environmental laws and doing things like, you know, replacing petrol with other resources, you know, that are that are renewable, is that really contributing to sustainability and how do we measure its contribution? Because you don't want to just sell something emotionally that made people feel good. You want it to be scientifically measurable to say this is going to work and people will accept this because you also have to look at the sociology. Are people going to be happy living this way? So because sustainability means it's policy that you want to carry out and feel comfortable with or can learn it and drop your own old attitude. So guys, we in most places we vote in the government based on whatever characteristics. OK, and then we're influenced by the government that we selected. And the government influences us in various ways, directly by direct policies and laws and regulations that you have to follow, or by, you know, consumer products that we buy are impacted by regulations and policies and practices that businesses have to follow, and policies that police have to follow in the way they treat us. So this is interesting when we look at governments. And like I mentioned earlier, you have to understand the government structure to understand how policy is passed and how receptive they are. What is their culture? What is their strategy for, for making policies? 
with people and policies for uh, entities too that are involved in the economy. Now guys, something very important too for a government is there has to be a sense of legitimacy. That means when we start looking at governments making policy, that means we have to show evidence. Is this coming from the people? Is it something that's being coerced? And guys, there is going to be not coercion, but influence. This is what lobbying is about. But activists also don't coerce because coerce means you're doing something kind of illegal, which does happen. But we, do, do we have an influence like, wow, I really like this group of people. So I'm going to push this to vote this way or make this policy that really is not sustainable. So we have to look at this legitimacy. When we start looking at sustainability, is there a legitimacy, a measurable legitimacy that these policies are not influenced by other factors that don't contribute to sustainability? So guys, we have different ways of running government at state and local levels. Um, at some levels, you could have people are always directly involved in voting on policy. That means when po people can suggest a policy, it gets worked up by the politicians and then people vote directly on what the politicians created. And they even have influence by looking at the steps along the way as the policy is being written. This is done a lot in California. This could also be situational. There are some things you want the public to vote on in a pure democracy, others that are not worth it because they might not be experts in that particular situation or may not know enough. Then there's representative democracy, which we see here a lot, in which we hope that we vote in people that represent our views in the formation of policy. And sometimes this is a little more heavily influenced by the elected officials. Okay. And then we have authoritarian governments. And this is what I run into in a couple of countries where we have uh, no meaningful elections. I like that, if any at all, because they have a, a supreme beam that's put into place. But you do have sometimes local politicians like governors or ministers or mayors, which um, could be selected or voted in. And again, this takes a different type of influence if you're looking at environmental policy. So you got to know who you're playing with. And you also got to know the culture of that government. I know in some uh, countries, people are argumentative. And you fight back and forth in what's called a dialectic to either one person wins or you come to a compromise. Uh, uh, Russia tends to be that way. A lot of Eastern Europeans tend to be this confrontational way. And eventually you battle it out. Everybody gets angry. You might have a war or two every now and then. Uh, you might curse in your own language so the other person understands what you're saying. And then they come to either some person's right, the other person's wrong, or you meet this dialectic consensus. That doesn't work in China. It doesn't work in other places I've been where you talk to the supreme authorities, either them, the, the top person or the intermediaries that that person put in place, and you just give them options, like I mentioned. Now, you can try to convince them with something. You give a little infomercial, but you don't force them. You don't say, I'm walking out today. Okay, and, and you got to be careful. In some groups, confrontation is found insulting. So it varies and you've got to pay attention to who you're working with. Even when we look at local municipalities, I'm sure we have little towns and homeowners associations that are definitely authoritarian. And, and I have to deal with that sometimes and I don't work well with that type of situation, but I, don't, I do know how to play their game. So, and this is just my honest opinion. When working with democratic systems in which the public plays some role, if not a lot of role, in policy, this is very difficult to do. Because I have to I have to find the groups of people that make the big difference. And I have to promote them to promote the view to people that need convincing. It's very difficult to speak into lots of people. And this is very true when you deal with the United States, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, India, okay, that have federal governing systems but require a lot of democratic input. Okay, I haven't seen too many total democratic governments except maybe Native Americans, which are beautiful to deal with. But again, you're dealing with each individual has to be respected. It's a very um, Kantian system of individual rights and you protect the individual's rights sometimes at the compromise of the good of the whole. Now we get into countries like China, unitary governing systems or, or you know, North Korea, which I don't want to go into. Okay, but I've dealt with Cuba a little once and, and I know who to talk to. 
and I know what to say and not to say. And I know I'm not going to go in there and walk out with a decision, but I give my very best. And what I do is I work within their culture and I make it look like almost, hey, you will like this. And I say, this will benefit you. This will make your people healthier and blah, 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 and this and that. And a clean environment's good for tourism and really not, you know, force something down their throat. So our government, United States, which you better know about because you've taken government classes properly and you hear about this enough on the friggin' news during an election. So our government, you know, we're constitution based, which many governments are, of course, not too many people say, hey, we don't have any written things about how to rule ourselves. So whatever. But um, the constitution supposedly represents the people. Okay. And everybody has their supposed individual categorical rights, even though we know it's within the realm of a social overall you know, um, utilitarian good. Okay, so we have our executive branch, which is, of course, the president, vice president, and the cabinet, which some of those people should be kept in a cabinet sometimes. But um, this is, the, you know, this is the boss. But the boss is not a supreme leader. They have to answer to the people. And the boss doesn't really directly answer to the people. Now, some they do, that's called the cabinet. Okay, so they rely on legislators or representatives to do that. Usually, um, you know, the Congress and then the Senate and the House of Representatives. Notice that it says representatives are supposed to represent you and whatever. And when it comes to elections, an electoral college kind of votes for you too, based on voting numbers, you know, and whatever. So um, we have an indirect path to the major governing people. And these are the people you really want to work with because they're the ones that write the policies and evaluate them and set the terms on them. The judicial branch, you know, this is where laws come in. They're the ones that work with the president, I mean, work with the legislator to say, hey, does this need a law or not? How are you going to enforce this? What are you going to do? And, and, and what should be the penalty? Okay, for doing this, and they will say whether things are fair or just sometimes. They'll take a philosophical role and say, you know, we really can't exclude this group of people, or this doesn't benefit them, or this hurts them. And they, you know, and then we're not going to go into the whole checks and balances between these three systems, where one is not supposed to rule. And then the problem becomes when you get partisanship parties, very strong parties. So then if this party is the same as that, is the same as that, you have a authoritarian government. When this is so fragmented that they're all different or split, then you have almost like a, 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 a complete democracy where everybody's views are just kind of not getting anywhere. They're not, they're not progressing because we're not coming to a common consensus because the plurality of the views. So understand your system and understand that there's an input. There are government entities, agencies that report directly to the president or indirectly there are agencies that these agencies can talk to the legislature. The legislature can use them as a reference. And the same is true for the uh, judicial branch. So the president has all these governmental entities over them that listen to the public and take public comment and help to fashion or carry out rules and regulations. So usually they generate the stuff based on input from agencies and with consultation with the judicial branch and, of course, with the executive branch. And sometimes they withhold from the executive branch and say, hey, here's a surprise bill. Guess what? We want you to look at it. And sometimes that pays off. Sometimes it doesn't. So how is governmental policy influenced? That means particularly the legislature and sometimes up to the president. And sometimes even you can petition the, uh, the Supreme Court on this. But there's the concept of power. Certain groups have more power to affect legislation and promote sustainability than others. And the problem is the more a group appears to be fringe or radical, probably the less effect they have. The more money a group has, the fact that they could pour money into something is very effective too. And those that can represent a bigger sector of voters could have a lot of power too. So power is important on making influence for sustainable policies. Then there's interest groups where they help to focus and fashion different types of legislation that we need to be doing and then bring the citizenry in there to say, hey, man, these, you know, a lot of the citizens want this. They, you know, they see this as necessary and I think we should move this along. And then there's the lobbyists who are paid people, very 
incredible people to be able to do their job that they did. I sucked at it. So I'm not as aggressive as many lobbyists are, but they know how to basically persuade government decisions. But of course, that has to be backed by something, usually an interest group or someone that has a lot of power and influence. So guys, once governments to make their decisions on policies and regulations and guidelines, they can make guidelines or regulations that are prescriptive. That means to literally tell somebody what to do, period. It's a law. This is the way you do it. It's part of your best practice. It's part of your strategy. And it's going to be part of your mission. We can make payments. This is done with a lot of agencies to encourage alternative energies. We can give alternative energy companies incentives. We give them money exactly to say, here, run your business and make a profit with this. Or at least break even for a while. Wish my parents had that type of thing going on. Okay, they could also give incentives by saying, I'm going to give you tax breaks. I'm not going to charge you income tax for this amount a year. I'm going to give you less taxes so you can increase your profit margin. This is one that doesn't always work well, particularly for large companies that can pay the penalties. You can give penalties that involve money or a criminal sentence in a nice, luxurious jail. You could set property rights on things and limit what things can be done in a particular area and also you can use persuasion so you can um so we can develop educational campaigns we do this a lot with public health with stds with smoking with other things because we don't want to set a law to say you can't smoke i mean it's already being done where you can smoke and in some places that you can't smoke and some jobs they won't hire you if you smoke so we can provide educational you know systems that promote it and even sometimes incentives to people and we sometimes give penalties to people that buy cigarettes because we just charge a lot of taxes and the same is true sometimes on gas when we want to discourage people from using gas we jack the price petrol companies are still making money because we jack the price but people are just are discouraged from using it so petrol companies still make money but they're selling less i like that I wish somebody would do that for me so these are all ways we can carry out policy and sometimes we can make it a law sometimes a recommendation sometimes a regulation so guys we don't have the time to go through every policy and act in this class but understand an act is an incredible broad sweep in law that actually is very difficult to change it takes literally an incredible acceptance by the whole government to change an act or to modify an act. These were created to be permanent things that impact environmental quality and are here to stay and have money put aside seriously all the time. So we have the Clean Air Act. People can tweak it, but you can't get rid of it without going through a lot of effort. A, pr a president can't make executive order to get rid of it. Now, little things within it, they can change. That's so you have the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. Resource Conservation and Recovery, we call RECRA. It sounds like something you say on Scooby-Doo. Okay, uh, that, that Scooby would say. So, you know, we have uh, uh, Environmental Res uh, Response Acts, what's called CERCLA. So these are all things put in place that says this is our standard operating mission as a country, and we will make these permanent. But it doesn't mean agencies within them have to exist. We can change some of the smaller parts of this. And this is where presidents and, and politicians become very good at tweaking. They can look at limitations and guidelines and set caps on regulations or say, we're going to do, uh, we're going to clean the environment this way and not that way. That we can do, but we can't change the nature of the act in itself. That means I'm going to have clean water, clean air, recover as many resources as possible and encourage the proper removal of hazardous wastes. So to end our story, every country that's a member of the United Nations, even countries that are not, that receive aid from them or aid from countries that work with those countries <coughs> um, that are United Nations members, we have intergovernmental organizations that try to unify the world's governments. And the United Nations, of course, a big one. And we sometimes have good relationships with them, sometimes bad relations. Some presidents love them, some presidents hate them. It's all a personality game with this. But the United Nations is setting global sustainability guidelines 
and we have an intergovernmental panel on climate change that's representing almost every country in the world on looking at policies that help the whole world to achieve this, not just one country, but sometimes they have to tell certain countries that produce a lot of pollution, you got to stop. And guys, a lot of it's pollution per person that we're looking at, not, not so much total pollution of a country, because that can make a big difference in the United States of all of us stop cut down by half of our pollution it is more effective than telling china to cut down by half because there's very few people making a little pollution that adds up to a lot just because of the size of the population so what do we do tell them half your population i mean like have thanos come down and just weed them that's kind of not good policy so read the united nations sustainable development goals there and, and these are growing but these are recommendations to how we can protect everything about the world and ensure that when we reach 2050 that we would have a carrying capacity that can support human population and hopefully cap out human population so that's a flat growth.